playback. Roll camera. Camera rolling. Playback, John. sociopathic view on life and murder. Today's character is Karen in her mid-50s, played by Donna Day. In the setting, we begin. Sound of keys locking the prison cell door. The faint sound of a fly which gets louder when indicated in script. Karen is sat on a cell bed Flicking through a tattered woman's magazine. I shouldn't be here. I'm innocent. I'm wasting my breath shouting. They don't listen. It's a travesty of justice. Why would I kill my own husband? The very thought. I wouldn't harm a fly. My sons would never speak to me again if I'd murdered him. And no matter how bad our marriage was, I wouldn't deprive them of a father. I have to admit, my behaviour caused the situation he found himself in, but it wasn't me that killed him. I'm mourning John in this cell and no one seems to care. I've been thinking about how we met at work. He was a skinny streak of nothing back then. He blushed at inopportune moments, especially where women were concerned. But I could see he had potential. Potential I could mould into the man I wanted. People listened when he talked. He was rather intelligent and John, he had bigger plans than just trying to negotiate my bra straps or find his way into my knickers. I liked that. He was ambitious. Life was an adventure then, backpacking around the world. He made me feel safe, but safe soon turned into boring. We married and children followed. He worked too much and I tried to be the dutiful housewife. There are only so many times you can iron a shirt or make a bed before it becomes rather tedious. I had my boys though and once they were past the messy toddler stage I really enjoyed their company. John stopped paying me attention and I felt rather taken for granted. Why did that happen? When the boys eventually left for university, I was suddenly struck by the terrible fact that I was to live alone with John for the rest of my life. I thought I could fan the flames of what we used to have, but even a Dyson could not stop the embers from extinguishing completely. On the evenings when he wasn't travelling or working late, he'd come into the lounge and seeing I was watching television, he'd touch loudly and disappear off into his office upstairs. When he did sit with me, he'd play Scrabble on his phone with a work colleague or a golfing chum. I'd occasionally start an argument just to get some sort of communication from him, but he hated to row and he'd get his keys and be off for a drive in his car. Short burst of sound of sports car. I swear that car was caressed more than I was. Ironic, really, dying in the arms of the thing he loved more than me. We developed separate social lives, but him on the golf course and me at Women in Business or with the book club girls. I guess this is where the story really starts. It was book club Sue's 50th birthday, so we all went out to celebrate. 
There was another group of ladies in the pub that night, a little more leery than us, but we got chatting and had fun, except one of the women kept staring at me. I wasn't imagining it. Every time I looked in her direction, her dark brown eyes were looking back. I remember thinking how good her makeup was. She had olive skin and almost black hair, quite exotic. She was petite, like a dancer, the kind of woman I'd always emulated. She was starting to make me feel uncomfortable, so when she visited the toilet, I followed her in. Stop. Pub sound, short burst of toilet flush. Is there a reason why you keep staring at me? I bravely asked when she exited the cubicle. Isn't it obvious? She countered. But I'm guessing you're straight. I blushed. I've never blushed before in my life and a sudden urge to find out what it would be like. I grabbed her and kissed her full on the mouth. In the words of Katy Perry, I kissed a girl and I liked it. So, it seems, did she because she kissed back passionately. It didn't feel wrong or seedy even though we were in the toilet. Nothing mattered, just being in that moment. I don't think I'd ever felt quite that way with John, even when we tried different positions. Eventually, we became too old to get into them. Nothing really set me on fire. Sex became functional. Sleep, breathe, eat, pee, have sex, and... He took so long. I prayed for premature ejaculation to strike him down. Sometimes I'd let him go to bed first and then wait until I could hear him snoring before I'd go up. Fly noise becomes louder. Karen swats that fly with her hand, and the fly noise goes faint again. I started seeing exotic hams in on a regular basis. If John stayed down in London, we would spend all night together, wrapped in each other's flesh. Sex wasn't that important, just lying there, skin on skin, kissing, caressing. She always smelt of jasmine, or was it roses? Perhaps both. She didn't seem bothered that I was married. She was a widow. She listened to me, bemoaning my plight with John the dull drudgery our marriage exposed. She never said anything, just listened. Then one day, when I was saying how our wedding anniversary was coming up and how it meant nothing to me, she suddenly said, why don't you get, get rid of him? A little taken aback, I offered, ask for a divorce. My brain started to race with all the awfulness that a divorce would entail. John would try and keep all the money. I'd be destitute and we'd have to go through the courts. She put her finger over my lips and looked at me with those deep brown eyes. There is another way. Go on, I insisted, my curiosity piqued. The best thing to do is to kill him. I had to pour myself a drink. Killing someone without being caught isn't that easy. You only have to watch Lady Killers with Piers Morgan to find that out. I've already done it once, she admitted. Sound the wine glass smashing. I dropped my glass. I had been sleeping with a murderess. Just say the word and I'll do it. Well, I couldn't think of anything else all the next day. That night in bed, as John snored next to me, I imagined smothering him with a pillow. He went back to London on the train that morning and I wandered around the house, imagining myself as the grieving widow. I picked out black outfits from my wardrobe. The thought of doing something so wrong made me feel excited, sexual, so I asked Hamzin to come over. We had sex for the first time. I loved her marshmallow breast that made my lip tingle when I put the brown nipples in my mouth. After we slept for a while, basking in the heat of each other's bodies. Fly sound increases. Karen swats that fly again and the fly noise goes faint. Down in the kitchen before she went home, she wanted to know if I'd given her proposal any thought. Part of me wanted to say yes, kill him. But then I saw a picture of him on the beach with my boys and my resolve crumbled. I told her I would ask him for a divorce. You see, I couldn't kill him. Well, I wouldn't harm a fly. She didn't look so pleased, but I thought she understood. My mother always said, strike while the iron's hot. So as soon as John came back from London, I sat him down with a big glass of wine and broke the news to him gently. John, I said, I want a divorce. He was furious, calling me all things like ungrateful and irresponsible. Well, I'd always been grateful for the home John provided and now the boys were gone, I had no responsibilities. 
He asked me if I still loved him and I shook my head. He grabbed me around the throat and slammed my body into the fridge freezer. Is there another man? He spat in my face and I answered honestly, there wasn't. He shouted, liar, and threw me to the ground. The violence was unexpected. He'd never been physically violent with me before. I'd hit my head on the corner of the countertop and was too dazed to get up. He went out into the garage and started his bloody car. Noise of car starting and driving off. Once he'd driven off, I moved myself into the lounge. I sat in silence, no TV. I watched the light outside grow dim until I was sat in darkness. I started to shiver and I knew I should go to bed, but... The doorbell rings. The doorbell rang. It was the police. They sat me down in the kitchen and broke the news that John had been involved in a traffic accident and was pronounced dead at the scene. Their voices went all distant and I felt like I was swimming underwater. I must have passed out because when I came around I was being offered hot sweet tea by the female officer. I told them he'd been drinking. Fly noise more intense. Karen swats fly with hand and the fly goes quieter but stays slightly raised. I had to identify the body. It was funny seeing him lying there, dead. I could almost see the boy I'd first met at work. I had a little cry and noticed his nails were turning blue. He liked blue. When I returned home, Tamsin was waiting for me. She was smiling. Was this you? I asked. I knew you wanted me to do it. I was repulsed. I told her I'd never wanted this. How was I supposed to tell the boys that they'd never see their father again? I was so angry I threw her out and this is where I made my mistake. I destroyed anything that would link me with her. I didn't know much about her really, not even where she lived. The police brought me in for questioning. They asked about the bruising and I had to admit that John had been violent. Funny, really. I thought about domestic science at school. They teach you how to iron a shirt, bake a cake, clean shoes, but not how to cover up bruising. They told me the car had been tampered with, so I came clean and told them about Tamsin. They asked if I minded if they took my fingerprints so they could rule mine out whilst looking for Tamsins in the house. They later told me that they had found my fingerprints under the bonnet of John's car. Well, I've no idea how they got there. Remembering how soundly I'd slept that night with Tamsin, I suggested that she may have drugged me and carried me down to the garage, put my fingerprints near the brake fluid. They said they had never told me it had been anything to do with the brake fluid. I told them Tamsin had indicated what she had done. This is when I got a lawyer and they arrested me. The lawyer told me if I pleaded guilty, he could use the domestic violence to get me a lighter sentence or even get me off completely. I told him that I was innocent and that I wouldn't harm a fly. I made him hire a detective to find Tamsin, but I couldn't give him much to go on. So she set me up and I've absolutely no idea why. I'm waiting to see if I'll get bail. It's taking them an age to call me back in. I've read this magazine three times now. The fly noise becomes very loud. She rolls up the magazine and swats the fly violently. You hear a loud thud and the fly noise is gone. There. Killed it. Flies are so terribly annoying. And sing. Thank you very much for listening to the first episode of Murder at Midnight. I Wouldn't Harm a Fly by Sharon Coltman starring... The lovely Donna Day. Look forward to next week's episode here on Condor Online, Murder at Midnight. If you want to follow us on Mixcloud channel, we are Condor Online on Mixcloud. And we also have a YouTube channel, Condor Online. And on our Condor Online, we will have the music and sound effects added to this, uh, this podcast. So... Thank you very much for following us here on Condor Online.